Welcome everyone. My name is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO of Anderson Ranch. Uh, excited to gather everyone today on this call uh, to hear from Michael Krieger and uh, Elizabeth Farrell. Uh, we'll be in conversation with him. We're so excited to have both of you here. And to all those joining uh, remotely, we're excited to bring you back uh, to Aspen soon. You will be glad you missed today, however. We woke up to about four inches of snow uh, and tree branches down everywhere, a little bit of a late storm. But summer's coming, and uh, we hope you're coming back uh, to campus soon. We'll be excited to have you. Uh, Liz, Michael, the, the topic today is to hear from you. Uh, so I will pass over, but I want to thank both of you for being here, and I want to thank the audience for joining and supporting the ranch. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Michael, we are thrilled to have you here today. And I really look forward to seeing your work and for to um, taking questions from the audience. I want to remind the audience that as you want to ask questions after we chat for a bit, um, you're going to be typing in your Q&A window at the bottom of the Zoom window. So um, take a look at your screen now and check that out and be prepared to ask lots of great questions. Um, so again, Michael, thank you for being here. As we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the anguish that we're all experiencing not only due to a global pandemic that has taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, but also the violence towards unarmed black people by white police in the US, and recently the murder of George Floyd. As we process this horror, we seek as artists to connect about the issues in our work and to create dialogue. Um, and Michael, maybe we'll start there. Where are you today in this search? Thank you, Liz. Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm glad you did. I'm feeling the same way and I want to acknowledge that uh, pain that we're experiencing. You know, it feels like uh, love and fear and mortal combat right now and it's almost impossible to, to escape that uh, anguish. Um, um, but I've, in a way, you know, this trauma that's, that's been uh, dispelled through all this and the protests. Um, while it, it does feel ripe with anger and, and pain, I, it also seems like such an incredible act of love. Um, so, dare I say, I feel some hope in there um, that we can carry on in a new way. And, I, you know, I felt terribly self-conscious about speaking about my work today, as I shared with you earlier, because I just you know, I feel like so many other voices uh, need to be heard right now and I just need to be listening, but I also know that art has to carry on and that we are part of the healing process. Um, so I'll do my best. Well, thank you. And we're really glad that you're here to share. And um, I, I think we agree as an arts organization and, and we really want to continue this dialogue. So thank you for participating in this important conversation. Um, You're welcome. We'd love to, we would love to um, see some images of your work and I know you've prepared some really wonderful things for us. Um, yeah, great. I, I'm going to start by sharing this image that I've made. This was the this was the last image I made before the COVID shelter in, the COVID-19 shelter in, and it's a draw, color pencil drawing, and it's about 20 by 24 inches. It's colored pencil and airbrush mostly, and the title of it is Heavy Times. And I think that was a, quite a, a premonition in a way. Well, the times were already heavy, weren't they? And, uh, and I was trying to express that in my drawing. A few, you know, several years ago, I, I moved to making these things that were much more landscape oriented. And I was really questioning if I could express certain kinds of content that I wanted to express by limiting myself in a way to just using the landscape. Um, and I've tried to make work in, in these pieces that has a real emotional content to it and using the landscape and line and color and so forth to do that. Um, 
Yeah, and you know, this is drawing. So this is, this is as you said, it's pencil, colored pencil, and you also use airbrush a lot in your work. Yes, uh, I started to. Yeah, and um, I know we've t actually taught together. I just wanted to let everybody know that. And I remember um, you were just beginning to kind of incorporate airbrush um, and, and the airbrush portion of, of the work, or at least this piece that I'm looking at, it's sort of reminiscent of Ed Ruscha or sort of pop artists who have, who have used sort of this gradient in the background and in various ways. I'm wondering how, how you're kind of continuing to use that in your work. Yeah, I did something that's a wonderful tool with the airbrush and coming from my printmaking background, I'm able to sort of simulate these these blend rolls or something that you might find in printmaking and they give a lot of uh, content to the work through the use of the, the way the color is used. Um, and I'll share this one with you it was the first drawing that I made while in the shelter in and uh, it's this image of a cave that I've visited over and over and uh, but in this instance uh, we, I really felt that feeling of being in the cave and, and what other people might have been feeling too, is feeling that sense of security or, uh, or sheltering in and looking out and longing to go out in a way or feeling that uh, uh, the coolness of the cave, but wondering about when it's safe to leave and so forth and thinking about how drawing is like that in a way, how we have to move inward to be able to go out to project something outward. Um, and so I think a lot about those kinds of things about the quality of the line, the quality of the drawing and how that might be in a way kind of telepathic and, and expressing human emotion and in a way almost prophetic in that it might exist uh, through time and, and continue to tell, tell different stories or express different emotions. Um, and in so I looked a lot at, at drawing through all different ages. And of course, this is from um, some early cave drawings. And I'm teaching drawing right now for the ranch online. So it's wonderful to share these things and, and uh, thinking about contour and gesture that we're talking about in class and how uh, wonderful these drawings are that you see in the caves. And I think often about how everyone draws and that that's something that we share universally and, and how unique that is in a way, because there aren't that many things that we share through all time universally that everyone draws. At some point, some people, maybe most people stop drawing um, or for whatever reason, they limit themselves with drawing, but it's still a, this incredible shared experience that we all have um, through all sides. And I find that quite profound. This is the most recent drawing I've made and it's for a new exhibit that's coming in the fall of uh, paintings and drawings of my work. And it all has to do, the whole show has to do with starting over, beginning again. And I had come up with this idea along, well, I don't know, maybe a year ago and I started working on the idea but now it seems ever more important in a way to think about how to start over, how to begin again. Um, and I've looked at nature as a, as a kind of reference point to try to learn from nature, uh, from plants and, and things that start over every year, right? In a way with a new <laughs> renewed hope and- uh, uh, Regeneration. Yes, right. But there's, there's, also, there's also destruction there uh, with the forest fire and that becomes a place of renewal. And this yet the colors, the yeah, colors well, that you're well, using are also very optimistic. And you did mention hope at the beginning. And I, I just wanna say that, you know, this sort of warm colors and these purples and yellows, um, they, have a, they have a sense of optimism to me. I don't know if that feels the same to you, Michael, but that's sort of how I look at your drawings a bit. Well, that's nice to hear. Um, I, this one was difficult to make in a way because I felt it was really uh, a sad piece in a way because it's not only just a, a fire caused by lightning, but it's part of the, the problem of uh, climate change mm -hmm. and the sort of out of control fires and how do we begin again there. Um, 
This is an older piece, and I wanted to share this one today because I really used to rely heavily on, on narrative and metaphor and symbolism. And so this shift to landscape things is, is quite different in a way. And this was a piece that I did. I did a lot of work around American history, as you know, because we first met when I visited RISD and we worked on this uh, Brown Brothers print together. Yes. Um, so I've done a lot of work around American history and trying to sort of retell or untell or <laughs> undo the mistellings of history in a way. Yeah. Um, but not in super overt ways, I think, in ways that are maybe a little more slippery or a little more, and they take a little more investment from the viewer. And so this one, it, you know, is a portrait of Thomas Jefferson, founding father, um, who through all history told to children has been told this, this, you know, man that could do no wrong and so forth. And well, of course, that's not entirely true. No. <laughs> um, in this instance, we see him pushing a shopping cart. Perhaps it's a TJ Maxx shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a good deal. Um, but one of the problems with Jefferson, of course, is he was a shopaholic. And uh, people don't all know that, perhaps, but he, he was, and he was obsessed with shopping, and he bought clothes and wine. He had over 300,000 bottles of wine when he died. And uh, books, of course, which later became the Library of Congress. Um, and he also owned slaves, and but he was opposed to slavery, supposedly. But this is the consequence, isn't it, of capitalism, that he was always living beyond his means. And, and to do that, he had to be exploiting someone else. Mm -hmm. And there's cert a certain hypocrisy, as you, as you point out, in, in sort of his ideals. And would you say that there is some humor in this piece as well? It's pretty heavy duty, but um, I, I, also, I also see some humor in your work. I think so. I hope so. I, I showed this piece in Charlottesville. I had a show there and I made the whole, the whole show was about sort of uh, taking apart Jefferson. And uh, I was so happy that the, the new curator at Monticello purchased this piece and it's in the collection there. And I spoke with her at length about and got to visit Monticello. If, if you've ever been there, it's, it's incredible. It's very modest in a way, but also uh, you feel a sense of his real intellect in that space, um, but you also feel a forebodingness of what that place represented uh, as a plantation. Um, and she, she told me when she was hired there at Monticello, she changed, radically changed the way they, they taught about Jefferson and gave tours. And they started pointing out here were the slave quarters and telling all of the stories about his affairs and things like that with uh, well, really, relationships with slaves, where they father, he fathered many children, and so forth. And she told me that over half the staff quit because they refused to tell this history. And this is really the, a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Where we're not telling the truth. We're lying to ourselves so dramatically that it's, it's really keeping this white supremacy alive. Mm -hmm. I wanted to share this Goya print because he's had such a big impact on my work. Um, and the thing about Goya is, you know, you look at his work, it's from so long ago now, but it still is so relevant. And I, in a way, I, I've tried to shy away from things that are really topical or current events. Because, not because I don't think it, that should be done, but I find that I try, I, I like the timelessness in a way to his work, that these did relate to specific events of his time, but they also have a timeless list to them. Of course, this piece is, a, is about uh, this man who's in the foreground, who's dying, and he's hoarded his money all of his life, and he's dying, and he's got these bags of gold, and this is it. This is what he's got in the end, and maybe he hasn't lived a rich life because he hasn't spent his money, or he hasn't shared it with other people, and so forth. And he's being taunted and, and, and uh, teased by these fellows in the background. Mm. And Goya sort of puts you in the position to deal with this moral dilemma, right? How do you feel about this man who's tortured and dying, teased by these other people? How do you feel about his greed in a way? And you have to confront those things on your own. He leaves room for the audience to sort of think about those things. And I've always really enjoyed that about his work. And it's interesting how he used caricatures, sort of a caricature of, of 
people. And I think there's a way that you, I don't know if you were inspired by Goya to do that in your work, but I think that you touch on that as well a bit. I've tried to, to, to do that in a way, and I certainly have taken uh, cues from Goya and also in a funny way from Bob Dylan, because he's been someone I've listened to so much and how he at one point refuted to do topical songs, uh, but you still find encrypted in his, in his, the rest of his work, this deep interest in, in humanity and social issues, but it's encrypted through other metaphors and narratives that maybe are somehow more uh, adaptable to time. This is a work by the Armenian artist Arshal Gorky, and this painting hangs in the Chicago Art Institute. And I love this painting, and I visited it all throughout my life whenever I have the opportunity. Um, it's titled uh, The Plow and the Song, and it's about the anguish of hard work, but also the jubilation of song. and. sort of ways to carry on, you know, ways to, uh, overcome, ways to, to, to uh, be human within that uh, sacrifice. Uh, sorry, I didn't know I would get so emotional. Um, I think, I think let's do that. And it's part of the power of art, I think, is that it, it, it stays the same. And, and I've been able to visit this painting so many times over the course of my life when I was a young student, until, until older, and, and, and the painting stays the same, and I'm so grateful for that, but I change, and I experience it differently each time. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. Well, and I think you also embrace, I mean, this is the perfect image for me to ask this question. You really in addition to learning from um, sort of a message, you also embrace nostalgia. So that next image of the, um, the Volkswagen, is that a Volkswagen bus or a, what? No, oh, it's not, no, but it, it, it's, it's not. It's, okay. <laughs> it's a van. It's a van. van. Yeah, so, so I'm curious a little bit too. I mean, you, we're, I wanna talk a little bit and you will talk a little bit more about the hippie culture, but, um, just sort of nostalgia and going back and going back in time a bit and, and sort of exploring something over and over again. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I think that this, this new, this body of work that I'll share here is called Palisades Park and it's about a specific uh, childhood memory. Oh. And uh, it is nostalgic in a way, but it's also a way for me to revisit um, my own experiences, sometimes traumatic, sometimes painful and, uh, revisit them as a memory and revisit them um, in a kind of hopeful way, I guess. I mean, um, one of the things about memories is they're really not true. <laughs> yeah. They're true to an extent, uh, but we don't really remember things exactly as they were. We change them over time and we also remember them differently at different times in our lives. Maybe what's more honest is the sort of emotional truth of a memory. So I try to encapsulate that. Uh, let me share a couple more of these. This is another one from Palisades Park. Mm -hmm. So there was a park near Sioux Falls where I grew up that we used to visit as kids. And, and we, you know, I had kind of a, a, a reckless sort of childhood in a way. We would often go off with older kids in, in slightly dangerous situations in somebody's van or something and go to the park and not really know how we would be cared for, how we would be treated or how we would get home or any of these kinds of things. And, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, part of my experience. And, but I, I look back at these things and I think about um, how the letting go of a painful memory is so important and how how practicing forgiveness is so important, even for yourself. And uh, it allows you a way uh, to create progress towards a better life. And I think that's so important. So, so they're, they're based on memories, but they're really optimistic, I think, in a way. And again, I'm trying to use the landscape as a way to embed this emotional content that someone else might be able to experience. I also would say that you capture your, I, 
not every artist has an investment in beauty. And mm -hmm. I think there's a way that even the way that you speak about your work, but the way I see you handle surface and the way you kind of try to capture a mood or a, a moment, whether it be the, the falling of a snowflake or uh, perhaps it's sort of, you're, you're definitely um, interested in time of day and light. And, and um, so I think that all kind of, kind of comes into the way that you think about, about these pieces. You know, absolutely. And this, this one's a good one for that. This is a, you find this horse here that's lost in, in the brambles or lost in this little craggy area. And uh, I, am, I suppose that horse is me, um, you know, as we find ourselves in our work a lot of times. But I, I was trying to express that feeling that you have when you move from the warmth of the sunlight into the coolness of the forest. And you probably experienced that in, in your neck of the woods. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And I, I have such uh, fond memories, clear memories in a way of that experience, just that physical experience of moving from the warmth of the prairie and then you walk into the forest and it's suddenly cooler and everything sort of changes and you become attentive to things in a completely different way. And maybe that becomes a grander sort of feeling or metaphor that other people can attach to. Mm -hmm. I thought I would share just a little bit about how I work on these drawings, if that's interesting to people. So uh, these are colored pencil drawings. And so I typically start drawing with the colored pencil. A lot of times we'll um, take my own photographs or I'll work from other photographs that I find or sometimes uh, bring different things in to draw from. Um, and I was emphasizing in my, in my class the other day about how it is very popular to draw from photographs um, but it's also so, I think it's so important to draw from life because you experience space differently. And then if you learn how to do that to a degree, you can translate that into drawing from a photograph. Where I find with people who only draw from photographs, they never are able to really interpret that depth of space as well. Um, so anyway, I start with drawing and, and building up the image. And then I'll actually scan my uh, drawing and then start creating uh, different layers and stencils in Illustrator. I actually use a lot of technology in my work, although I kind of hide it. Uh, <laughs> and then I'll cut out stencils with stencil material on the laser cutter or, or the vinyl cutter. And then that's when I start incorporating the airbrush. So I can block out certain things and give them color and, and not other things. And so here's the finished drawing. So this is sort of that scene of of uh, blanketed snow in the aspens, and then the bright sunlight that's come out in the day. Yeah, and drawing, I mean, printmaking is a really natural sort of extension of drawing. I, we've talked a lot about drawing, we've talked a lot about whenever you're describing your work, you, you use the word feelings, you use a lot of sort of emotive words. And I'm wondering if drawing for you is sort of the most immediate expression or sort of almost a primal um, expression for you or is it more meditative? I'm, I'm curious how as you're drawing and as you're working, um, you may be in many different states of emotion, but I'm wondering um, if you can describe that a little bit for us because there are a lot of artists watching and we all have different ways of working. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's rarely meditative, which is sad. <laughs> um, we could all use more meditation time. I yeah. know. Yes, I have started meditating recently more. That helps. Um, I think it's, it's, in the, it's in a state of becoming. It's always in a state of becoming something until it's finished. <laughs> and it's trying to maintain that state in a, in a vigorous and active way. Um, that's the challenge. But I do find it to be quite telepathic in a way, a way to transmute your emotions. And I think drawing has that quality. Um, and I don't know if it's more than other ways of working, but it certainly is very direct, isn't it? Um, 
and everyone has a unique way of making marks. Everyone's drawing quality is expressive of them. And I think that is unique. Now, of course, the difference, I was having this conversation with someone who does a lot of paintings recently. You don't have to charge the paintbrush or you don't have to charge the pencil. And that, that actually is quite a different, makes quite a bit of difference. That, that moment of pause to add more color to the tip of your brush changes the way you make. And mm -hmm. so that the, the idea that this can keep flowing out of the end of my brush or my pencil is actually really crucial to the process. And, and hearing the other day of the artists that you had on um, uh, speak about that idea of the, of the coming out of your heart, coming out of your mind, coming out of your hand so very directly in this loop mm -hmm. that the drawing does is, uh, is kind of a beautiful way to put it. I really enjoyed that when she spoke about that. Well, and the way you describe coming out of the warm sunlight into a cold forest sort of describes that also a moment of awareness. So it's maybe a slight disruption in, a, in an experience. And um, so as you're, as you're drawing, you're trying to hang on to that sort of continual experience. And then sometimes there's that disruption, whether you it's charging your brush or changing a material or or doing right. something like that. I think you described it pretty well with, with that last piece. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if there's another one there. Oh, this is a different body of work. But we could take other questions too, or I could share some other things. It's up to you. Ah, absolutely. You actually have quite a few um, people asking questions. So if you're, if you're ready to do that, I, I would actually love to see that other piece though, Michael, because- um, okay. That's exciting. If maybe we can talk about it for a few minutes right before I delve into questions, just because I'm very curious. <laughs> yeah, so I started making paintings about four years ago. I had mostly done drawing and printmaking before that, although this was very printmakerly. But yeah. it's a clock. It's a, it's a paper plate, a clock that my son made and brought home uh, from, uh, you know, school. And I recreated it as a painting. It's, th it's very three-dimensional, but it's still also on linen and so forth. And this was for an exhibit I did a couple years ago that was about time. And I was thinking about child's time and how child's time is different than our time. And uh, uh, the way that they perceive time is so different than, way, than we perceive time. And then there were other pieces within the exhibit that talked about uh, adult time, I guess, or time's time, we think about time in other ways. So there's the paper plate that, that my son made. And then you can see below as I was trying to create this canvas by uh, casting a paper plate and so forth. That's great. And then this painting was also in the exhibit. Uh, so I dealt with the seasons also in this exhibit as a way to talk about the passing of time. I love this piece um, and I'm glad you showed it. I was really hoping you would because I've seen, um, I think you might've posted a fraction of it or you might have posted this on social media at some point and I, I I just love the sense of solitude as well and actually I think that a lot of your work definitely evokes a sense of solitude um, and and this makes me think of being on like Highway 50 in Nevada and not knowing <laughs> you know where the road ends um, so it's it's a stunning piece. Oh, thank you. I was shocked by the emotional reaction to this painting because I really thought it was going to be the sleeper in the exhibit because it was such a, it's such a, a personal memory in a way. Um, but so many people related to it because of that feeling I guess we've all had if you've driven through the snow in your car and you feel warm in the car, but you know there's peril outside and you've, you've got to get where you're going and, and, and you know, you're just going to have to get through it. Um, and that's what it's about and people related to that and uh, you know I tried to to be very sincere in my work in the last I tried to shed myself of, of uh, irony and sarcasm and even uh, kind of more conceptual veins because I really want to embrace sincerity and earnestness in my work and that's led me to making these things that are far more 
uh, emotional way, they've been risky for me to make because I oftentimes feel like no one's going to get this. <laughs> Why am I giving out all of this of myself that I feel like is just is just so uh, cryptic in a way? But I found that people do respond to it. Well, and I think sometimes, and not to go off on too much of a tangent, because now you've got quite a few questions, so I'm going to ask you, but I do think sometimes we as artists, we also don't know always where the strength in our work lies. And I think as your students are watching this and other artists are, are watching this, it's always, I mean, that's where having a curator or being in a show where you have feedback about um, what work stands out is always helpful. I definitely respond to this and I'm so glad that, you know, you put it in the show and you, and you showed us because it's so, so stunning. Um, I'm going to, are you ready for a question, Michael? Can I? Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I have a question from Kevin Haas and um, he says, hi, Michael. Um, could you talk about light and color in your work as a narrative element? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, well, I think I'm thinking about that piece with the horse in it and trying to find those moments, um, those moments where you really are feeling the light and the color in the piece. Um, but also I've used, I've done a lot of work um, and I'm working on some now actually for my next show that are moments of dusk and dawn. And those are really crucial moments for me in time. Um, and so that, I think, relates to the narrative of finding a space in the narrative. It becomes a beginning, it becomes an end. Um, so in a way, it has a kind of cinematic quality to it um, as it breaches these narratives. Uh, but also, I find it fascinating that this is one point in time when all the animals stop speaking. And it's that moment uh, at dusk or dawn. And so the animals of the night stop. And then the, it's a moment in time before the animals of the day start, the birds and the other animals start speaking and there's that little pause in the world. And I just love that. I think that's, that's really interesting. I think that really also connects again to your description of walking from the sunlight into the forest. So I think that's an interesting um, sort of, um, concept that you're exploring and maybe not even totally consciously all the time. I mean, this is really new work, um, but I think it's, it's a really intriguing one. You have another question. Um, this is a question from Deb Rosenbaum. Um, Deb asks, can you talk about your process in using the airbrush? Is it color laid down first that you then draw on top of? And what kind of drawing media do you use? So, um, Deb is a, a, um, a student, a frequent student at Anderson Ranch, and I'm sure is very interested in, in process. So thank you, Deb, for your question. Yes, I'm happy to share about that. Yeah, I started using the airbrush maybe four or five years ago. And I would, at first, I would just use it as an overlay. So I would create the drawing, um, and then I would spray it over the drawing to give it color in certain areas. Uh, but recently I started preparing the paper first with a layer of airbrush color, then drawing on top of it and adding more light airbrush um, and sort of layering it in different ways. Um, I use uh, just acrylic uh, airbrush paints and I almost always have a, a, a matte additive to it because I don't like shiny at all. <laughs> Even in the paintings are all matte. Really? <laughs> I don't like anything shiny on my work. It's all got to be matte finish. But the airbrush also gives it this uh, incredible uniformity that I like. So at the end, if I spray it with the color or I add a tint of something, it tends to sort of unite everything. It, it in a way looks more like a print that way, <laughs> like a lithograph or something, less like a colored pencil drawing. But the drawing is all done currently with Prismacolor. I used to use the very thin pencils, which are much harder, but I've switched recently to using the Prismacolors, which are softer, yeah. um, primarily because the drawings are much bigger and I like that, that thicker kind of cranny line. Yeah, and easier to kind of cover a larger area, it seems. Yeah, 
Yes, I go through a lot of pencils. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. I bet you have, do you keep all the, the nubs? Do you have? Yes, but I'm now contemplating getting rid of them. <laughs> oh, sometimes that's good too, to regenerate, right? <laughs> right. Um, so you have a question um, from Nancy Lovendahl. She asks, your use of all over texture to describe a botanic plant or rock texture running into each other, such as inside the cave piece, seems like a new graphic language rather than something from life. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss how you developed these marks? That's a great question. Actually, I'm going to be talking to my students about that tomorrow, I think, and it's the idea of developing drawing languages to describe things. When you look at nature, like say you look at a tree or something, and you try to draw that tree, well, you can't, you can't really draw every single leaf on the tree. So you have to invent a language to, to describe the leaf um, in another way. And you have to understand the leaf and how it moves and how it flops and how it fits in space in different ways to be able to really articulate that language. And the longer you do it and the more you try it, the better you get at drawing that language, the more fluid it becomes. Um, I actually draw fairly rapidly. Uh, you would think maybe it's very slow and painstaking, but I actually draw quite, quite furiously and quickly. Um, yeah. And so when I did that cave drawing, this is a maybe funny and sad story. I finished the drawing and I was so uh, happy to be finished with it. And then I, I saw a little area on it that I wasn't happy with and I attempted to erase it. Horrible mistake. And I made a hole in the drawing when I did that and the whole drawing w was ruined. <laughs> and, uh, and so I remember telling my, my, my wife what I had done and she said, Michael, you need to burn that drawing in the backyard. So I did, and I felt better. But then I went and I made the drawing again. But I had developed that language, so it was more fluid in a way to redraw it. And I actually redraw, redrew the entire drawing in, a, in about a, a one evening. But it's about creating these languages uh, to describe a rock. And once I've created that language, then I can just reproduce. I can sort of, it's, it's sort of a way for me to allow the drawing to grow on its own. Mm -hmm. And I can understand in a way how the facets of it work and I can build a shape or an interior space because I know that language well enough. Yeah, and I think when one is learning to draw for maybe the first time or going out to draw a landscape for the first time, we can be very overwhelmed by seeing all those leaves, as, as you say, and, and thinking, I have to draw every single separate leaf. How do I, how do, I do that? And how do, I, how do I make that language? So that's, that's an interesting description of that. Um, we have another question from Stacy Waddell. She Stacey. says, hi, Michael. <laughs> can you speak about what it means to be committed to drawing as a practice? and teaching drawing during an era where digital processes have become more provocative? Wow, oh, that's a good question. I, I've been teaching drawing now for about 25 years and I teach every semester I teach drawing um, and I teach the freshman level drawing. So it's the entry level students. And I still am so excited about teaching drawing. It's kind of weird. Um, I just love to see how quickly people learn drawing because when you first start drawing and you don't have a practice in it you can learn very very rapidly and to describe things and I love to see people do that. Um, I find that that uh, students are really attracted to things that are non-digital these days and uh, and although I do have sometimes a hard time getting them to put their phones down to draw <laughs> um, this, the act of doing something in physical space is quite exhilarating in a way uh, for them. So I don't have a great conflict with that, at least in those entry level drawing classes. Um, yeah, but, but the thing that, that I do encounter a lot of times, and I've talked to my students about this a little bit in this class this week, is that people usually have a preconceived idea about what they want their drawing to be. And that's one of the biggest hurdles in learning how to draw is that you, you have an expectation of the outcome. And when you do that, you don't get to experience the drawing in the present moment while you're making it. 
Absolutely. You're always thinking about what it's going to be like in the future. And you, you miss out on the experiences of making it along the way, allowing it to become something uh, and how crucial that is to having that in, invested sort of content in the drone. Yeah, and not to really go too deep into some of your earlier work that I know about, but you've definitely made a whole body of work that celebrates sort of the idea of doodling. And I, I would maybe add to that or ask you a follow-up question about that notion of doodling. Um, people tend to kind of think of it as not, not real drawing or as sort of this thing you do when you're bored and it's just sort of silly, but you, you know, you made a series of prints that were based on your notebooks as a high school student and this idea and which also goes back to nostalgia, but can you say something about doodling? You've showed us a lot of really beautiful finished pieces, but they still retain a quality of um, drawing that is more spontaneous. So how do you how do you feel about doodling and how does that come into your work now? It does it at all anymore. I don't know. I, don't, I probably should doodle more. I don't <laughs> doodle as much as I used to. Mm. I love looking at those drawings I made and you know when I was in high school and the notebooks and stuff because I'm able to see back into time in a way to feel you know that and that's the way a drawing can be uh, can transport you in a way you can go back to that very moment when you made it at least I can I feel like I can do that and it's a uh, it's almost like a kind of time travel back to that it's you know moment when you made it and I think that's quite fascinating um, but I think it's important to make mistakes when you draw. And people oftentimes feel like that's the last thing you wanna do. But I think that when you make mistakes when you draw, it reveals the struggle that it takes to make a drawing. And people really wanna see that. It's worth seeing. Absolutely, and you know, not everything is slick and, and beautiful and easy. And I think showing struggle, making mistakes, and continuing to carry on. I think actually drawing is a brave act. And I think it's something that, um, as you said, everybody has done, everybody should do more of, and perhaps especially adults. Um, you ask a room of children who can draw, every kid raises their hand. If you ask a room of adults who can draw, you might get one or two people embarrassingly raising their hands and not wanting to brag and, you know, it, it seems so important to, to remember that um, nobody's perfect and to show imperfections is, is, is a good thing. Yes. Why did they stop drawing? I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have one last question I'm going to um, pose to you and let's see. Um, this, this question is about, um, you, you mentioned a little bit about photographs, but a question about, do you draw from photographs? And if so, do you trace or transfer them onto a surface? Uh, how, do you, how does your source material come into your work? I do use photographs. Um, I take a lot of my own photographs. I wish I could show them because it's so funny. I walk around with a piece of white foam core and I stick it behind a plant and then I take a photograph of it because I want to extract it from the background so that I can see it better when I draw it. Um, so I do a lot of that. And, uh, and then I, I, a lot of times I just have to, I need a certain thing. And so I just kind of scour the internet till I find an image that I like, uh, which is something I always kind of warn my students about doing because it's a very predictable way of finding images. Um, but they become a kind of hybrid of these things. They become the kind of hybrid of a photographic resource, of um, a drawing language that I've created, or some other thing that I, you know, that I've found that I need to use. Um, sometimes I do do project things onto a painting surface. I, I don't know if this is, yeah. So here's this painting before the snow was added to it. And I, and I, I took a photograph and projected it onto the canvas to help me get the painting along. That's never really enough for me. So I have to stop doing that at some point and then change it. 
Um, and then the snow is added to it as a next layer. So it's a real amalgamation of different things. And I don't think that I have a, a one way of doing it. Yeah, it's been um, really kind of wonderful to watch. You know, when you described, you said people probably imagine that I draw slowly, but I draw quickly. I've had the pleasure of being able to watch you draw at times um, as a visiting artist here, as a co-teacher and to watch you work. And it's really interesting over the years too, to just watch you discover new processes and to incorporate them into your work. And I think that's one of the joys of being an artist is finding a new, that new thing that really resonates and, and works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Michael, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful conversation and for generously showing us your work and oh, my um, your vulnerability. I, I always enjoy talking with you. It's wonderful to see your face and, you know, um, also to have you teaching an online class, drawing class with us this week. So thank you for participating and supporting the ranch in that, in that way. Um, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And um, I have a couple of announcements before we, before we um, leave here. Um, our next event is an art salon with Eleanor Carucci. It's Tuesday, June 16th at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We also have a Thinker Th Thursday on June 18th at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Virtual events are added to our YouTube channel and our website all the time. So please, um, you can watch this later on YouTube if you so choose. And also we do have online workshops like the one that Michael's teaching right now. They are filling up fast. A lot of them are full, but we're adding more all the time. So please keep checking our website. All of our links are on the website, so please register um, for our events and our workshops. And uh, Michael, thank you again. Really wonderful to have this conversation. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for Thanks everybody. everybody. Good to see. <laughs>